Um, please uh, welcome back to the uh, afternoon session. Uh, all of you, I think, have had some introduction to Raji because of yesterday's dinner, but it's just kind of testament uh, to, to uh, Raji that he's really a great friend of the workshop and has been here um, a couple of times. Uh, uh, last time he was here, uh, was really actually ex extremely good for a lot of the students. If you haven't yet had the opportunity to, to either talk to Rajiv or um, you know talk to him about your research, please try and do so. The, uh, the feedback that we got from a lot of students was that was among the most helpful things that you could do. And uh, certainly with Rajiv, it's, it's something I think that uh, many of the people knowing their interests you'd, you'd benefit from. So um, uh, Rajiv teaches at um, Barnard College in Columbia uh, University, but he's also associated with the Santa Fe uh, Institute and uh, has, is also, along with Rohini, one of uh, INET's inaugural uh, grantees. So today he'll be speaking about uh, the issue of the economics of group income. Yeah. Before, just one announcement. I don't know if you know that the dinner this evening, I understand, moved up from eight. Yeah. Now, it's important to realize that interracially uh, stratified allocations can it covers a very broad range of allocations. For example, so this neighborhood here, where the where the people above the thresholds live, we're going to call the upper tail neighborhood and this neighborhood the lower tail neighborhood because you're getting the lower tail of the distribution versus the upper tail of the distribution, right? Okay, it's important to realize that the upper tail neighborhood can have a lower average income than the lower tail neighborhood. It's, it's possible. It can still have an interracially stratified allocation. Why? Push this to the left and push this extremely to the right, okay? And you'll have, you can have the, almost the entire black population except for the very, very tiny bit at the bottom living with a very, very tiny sliver of the white population at the top, and that neighborhood would have a mean income, which is roughly equal to the mean income of the black population. And so the upper tail could be poorer than the lower tail, right? So interracial stratification does not restrict, does not force the upper tail neighborhood to be wealthier even than, than the lower tail. Furthermore, the upper tail neighborhood could be majority black, right? It could be wealthier and majority black. So there's all kinds of allocations that are consistent. The point I'm trying to make is that interracial stratification does not restrict the set of allocations in, 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 in a very particular way. All it says is that you know, if, if X lives in the upper tail, then people in that same group who are richer than X also live in the upper tail. That's all it says. Good. So, uh, um, okay, and the third thing we need to define is something called a marginal bid rent. Right? It's very common in urban economics. So, what do we mean by marginal bid rent? Suppose that the, uh, uh, suppose, to keep things simple, suppose that the, uh, uh, Lower tail neighborhood has rent rho equal to zero, and the rent rho, I shouldn't use it, I shouldn't use rho here, but just think of think of rho, this, the variable rho as being the rent premium, the extra rent that you have to pay to live in the upper tail neighborhood. It could actually be negative. And again, we're not ruling out that possibility. But this is the extra rent that you want to pay to live. Uh, suppose it's positive. This is the extra rent that you uh, they have to pay if you want to live in the upper tail neighborhood. It will have to be positive in equilibrium. But um, the question then is, uh, so these people live here and pay row, and these people live here and they escape paying row. Okay. And the question is, what kinds of allocations are, uh, are stable? And to understand that, we need this concept of a marginal bid rent. What is a marginal bid rent? The marginal bid rent, once you have, once you have an interracial, interracially stratified allocation, you have your two thresholds, right? For, for this person, you can ask, how much would this person be willing to pay in order to live in the upper tail neighborhood, right? Rather than in the lower tail neighborhood, given, given this allocation. So, 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 so any particular allocation will generate an average income here, an average income here, a racial composition here, a racial composition here. Given those racial compositions and average income, you can say, you can ask for each person in this income distribution, you can say, how much would they be willing to pay here rather than here? And the answer to that question that you get from this exact person is called the marginal bid rent for blacks. And the answer to that question you get from this particular person here is the marginal bid rent for whites. Okay? Obviously, somebody richer than this person will have a higher 
willingness to pay to live in the upper tail neighborhood, and people below that will have a lower. But the marginal bid rent is defined as the amount that the, this threshold person is willing to pay to live in the upper tail. Is that clear? Those are, that's all you need to. Those are the three concepts you need to know. Upper, you know the in, interracial stratification, marginal bid rent, and upper tail name. Okay. So then the question is, okay, what allocations are, are, are stable? So I'm going to just illustrate this with an example. So think of two groups again. Let's let's take black and white. Take two neighborhoods of equal size, as you have there. So suppose that they're of equal size and they have uniform rents within the neighborhood. That's what I've been assuming over there. And suppose that the income distributions look like this. So suppose that the income distributions for the black income distribution take uniform distributions. Really simple example here. The results are much more general. But so the black income distribution is between 0 and 0 0.7, and the white distribution is between 0 0.3 and 1. Okay? So you can think of an income of <coughs> 0.6 as corresponding to 60% of the richest person, right? because the richest person has income 1. Okay? So you can interpret the incomes as being percentages of the highest income. Right? Okay. Suppose that the black share of the population is 45%. Let's ask the first following question. Now, <coughs> One way, one way to generate an interracially stratified allocation is to set these thresholds equal to each other. So you could fix these two things, just draw a straight horizontal line that cuts across the two distributions, and do it in such a way that you fill both neighborhoods. Right? They're of equal size. So you end up with half the population here, half the population here. There's going to be a unique common threshold right? that will give you uh, 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 that particular interracially stratified allocation. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that particular allocation corresponds to pure sorting by income. That is the allocation where the rich live with the rich, poor live with the poor, okay? regardless of which group they belong to. Right? And so let's start by looking at that. What does that look like? Okay. Well, it's easy in this example to calculate that. Here's the black income distribution. And you have to set the common threshold, YB, YW. You have to set that common threshold at 0.52, okay? uh, taking into account that the black population is 45% and the white population is 55%. And then you take you know, this sliver of the black population and this chunk of the white population, and they go to the upper tail neighborhood right there, which is in blue. And you take this segment of the, these two populations and you put them into the lower tail neighborhood. This is pure sorting by income, where the marginal households in the two groups have exactly the same income, which happens to be 0.52, okay, 52% of the largest income. This is not going to be an equilibrium allocation. It will not, it cannot be, right? But let's just think through why that is the case. Now, if it were the case that you had an allocation like this, right? if you had an allocation like this, you can, again, carry out these computations. You'll find that the average income in the upper tail neighborhood is 0.72. I don't know if you can see that. But the average income is uh, 0.72. And the racial composition, beta here, refers to the proportion black. So the proportion black in the upper tail neighborhood is about 24%. And here, the proportion black is 66%. And the average income is 31, 0.31. Okay? So mu refers to average income, beta refers to black percentage. Okay? Any allocation will give you some mu beta for each neighborhood, any allocation. In particular, pure sorting gives you this particular betas and mu's. Okay? Now, why is this not, why can it not be an equilibrium? Right? Somebody wants to move. Well, in order for this to be an equilibrium, this person with 52% income has to be indifferent between these two neighborhoods. They have to be indifferent between these two in order that the people who are richer strictly prefer this one and the people who are poorer strictly prefer that one. Okay. Furthermore, this person has to be indifferent also between these two. But these two people have the same income, the mu of C, right? So they have the same income. And so, uh, you know, when they're trying to decide between this neighborhood and this neighborhood, any particular rent of the upper tier neighborhood, any particular row that leaves this guy indifferent cannot leave the other guy indifferent. Why? Because although they're facing, they're facing the same rent differential, all right? they have the same individual income, they're facing the same differential with regard to mean income, but one of them is facing a neighborhood that is 24% of their own group, and the other is facing a neighborhood that is 76% of their own group, right? Given their preferences, they're not going to feel identically about those two things. 
One may you know, be better off than the other. We don't know because you've got this inverse U shape. Okay? But they're not going to be exactly the same in terms of how they feel about these two neighborhoods. And so therefore, their marginal big rents are not going to be the same. And if their marginal big rents are not going to be the same, then if the marginal big rent of one is equal to the actual rent, then the marginal big rent of the other would be either too high or too low. Right? And they're going to want to move. OK? So that's, that's roughly the argument. I mean, you can go through. It's, it's a little bit sloppy and hand wavy, but that's roughly how the argument goes. So pure sorting generically cannot be an equilibrium. So to finish up, what can, what does equilibrium look like? Um, well, let's define it formally first. An equilibrium is an allocation of households across neighborhoods and a profile of rents such that nobody wants to move. And we're going to be interested in two things. One, what kinds of allocations can be equilibrium? And two, what kinds of allocations are stable equilibria, stable in the sense that small perturbations will be self-correcting and will bring you back to the equilibrium. Whereas unstable means that you know, small perturbations will lead you to shoot up somewhere else. So those are the two questions I want to answer, and then I'm going to stop, right? Because I said, you know, this is notation, which I've already introduced. Uh, this is notation. Beta i is the black share of neighborhood i. Mu i is the average income of neighborhood i. Rho is the rent you have to pay to live in the upper tail neighborhood, the rent premium. <coughs> yb, yw are the two thresholds, right? And any interracially certified allocation. All of these things are endogenous, right? The only thing exogenous is the income distributions and the preferences. All of these things have to be determined in equilibrium. Okay? So we have to figure out what's the equilibrium values of beta, mu, rho, yb, yw. Okay? Threshold income is also determined in endogenous. What? The threshold income is also Yes, yes, because, yes, because it could be anything. I mean, it, you know, if I push this up and I push this down, I could say, is that an equilibrium? Or I could do it more and say, is that an equilibrium, etc. And there will only be some subset of thresholds, threshold pairs, which are consistent with equilibrium. If I just pick any, uh, pick any arbitrary thresholds that fit the neighborhood sizes, just at randomly just pick you know, some YB and the corresponding uh, uh, YW that fills up the neighborhoods, the chances are it will not be an equilibrium. So, so the actual YB and YW are equilibrium. But actually, in a sense, only one of them is endogenous because once you get one, then the other is determined by the adding up constraint. Yeah, because the neighborhood sizes are fixed. Yeah. So in a sense, they're not independent of each other. Yeah. So the pair is endogenous, but if I can tell you one, you get the other. You can reduce the other. That's that's an important point to keep in mind. Okay, these are two equilibria. All right, there are two equilibria for this particular example that I gave you. They can be in principle a lot more than two, but there are two. It's important for us to understand what these look like. And only one of them will be stable. Which one is stable? And why is that the only one that is stable? And what are the implications of that for group inequality? Right? Those are the last four things I want to get through, and then I'll stop. OK. Here's one equilibrium. This is an equilibrium. Yeah. At this equilibrium, the entire black population lives in the lower tier neighborhood, along with the lowest income whites, and then the upper tier neighborhood is 100% white. Okay? So here's an allocation. It's intra-racially stratified. The black threshold is 0.7. Right at the top, the white threshold is 0.36. So from 0.3 to 0.36, you have the lower tail, and above that is the upper. Okay? That's an equilibrium. Okay? I, uh, the way to check that it's an equilibrium, we have to look at what's the marginal bid rent of this guy versus this guy. Okay? Now. This guy, 0.36, has to be indifferent between the two neighborhoods. Okay? Because if, if this person has a strict preference for one neighborhood over the other, they'll move. All right? and, and people close to them will also move. They won't stay where they are. Um, so if this guy is indifferent between the two, then the rent of the upper tail neighborhood must exactly match the marginal bid rent of this person. And if the rent matches the marginal bid rent of this person, to verify that this is an equilibrium, we need only show that the marginal bid rent of this guy is uh, 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 lower. If the marginal bid rent of this guy is lower, and the actual rent in this neighborhood is equal to the marginal bid rent of this guy, then this person won't want to move, and therefore everybody poorer than this person also won't want to move. 
that's the argument to show that it's an equilibrium, but it can be done. So this is an equilibrium with a lot of segregation. 90% of this neighborhood is black. 0% of this neighborhood is black. The average income here is 0.35, which is averaging across all these people plus this lot. Okay? And the average income here is 0.68. So you've got quite a bit of income differences between these two, plus a lot of racial differences between these two. However, this is also an equilibrium. This is also an equilibrium. Here's an equilibrium which corresponds to something we never see in American cities. And we need to think about why we never see it. And think about whether we never see it because people preferences are not consistent with it or for some other reason. Okay, I just want to keep track of time. Good, 10 minutes. So what does this equilibrium look like? This equilibrium has a bulk of the black population minus the very poorest segments living with the top sliver of the white population in the upper tail neighborhood and then everybody else in the lower tail. Let's look at what the racial composition is. The lower tail neighborhood has a ra racial composition of 16% black. Why? Because most of the blacks are in the upper tail. <coughs> so this is only 16% black. The upper tail neighborhood actually is 74% black. Okay? The mean income here is 0.49 and the mean income here is 0.54. Not much difference in income between these two. But the upper tail neighborhood is richer. Okay. One thing I forgot to tell you is that in this neighborhood, if we look here, this just describes that equilibrium, this row. And the last element of that row is the rent, is the rent of the upper tail neighborhood. And in, in that segregated equilibrium, the rent is 0.11, which means that people with income less than 0.11 simply cannot live there. Okay. In, fact, in fact, as you see, the, the poorest person living in the uh, uh, upper tail is, has 0.36. So they pay about one third of their income in rent. Now, but the rent for this second equilibrium, the, the second row, is much, much less, 0.02. What, what that means is that the marginal people, this marginal person here, really doesn't care too much. It's not that, you know, doesn't have a strong preference for the upper tail neighborhood. Well, why don't they have a strong preference? They don't have a strong preference because the mean, the incomes are, uh, sorry, here. Because the incomes are not that different, right, firstly. And secondly, the racial composition here, remember, you've got that inverse U-shape. The racial composition here, you know, is mostly black, but that's okay with them because they have this pro-integrationist preferences. In fact, in fact, they prefer that to be only 16% of their own type, right? And that's why they're willing to live here, and that's why people richer than them are willing to live here. So you can work through the logic of this. All the slides are on the, in the Dropbox, but this is also an equilibrium. However, it's a very weird equilibrium. The more affluent neighborhood is predominantly composed of the less affluent group. The reason it can be in equilibrium is because preferences are co-integrationist enough to induce the more affluent whites to actually want to live there. Right? So it's consistent with equilibrium. So why don't we see it? And the reason we don't see it is because it's unstable. That's the last argument I want to make. Small perturbations away from this will drive you all the way from here. A little small shift will drive you all the way from here, which is an equilibrium, to here. Right? That's the last argument I want to make. And then I want to look at the implications of that. Okay. So, Here's how, here's how you show it. So this is the marginal bid rent. And the, the horizontal axis is the income of the marginal white household. So the horizontal axis gives you YB. All right? Now, this diagram doesn't care about equilibrium or not equilibrium. All it says is, what's the marginal bid rent of the two, of black and white households, as you change the marginal white household, YW. Okay? So YW, as YW goes up, YB must go down. As YW push, pushes to the right, right, that means you're putting fewer and fewer whites into the upper tail neighborhood. YB must go down, so you're putting more and more blacks into the upper tail neighborhood. Right? And the question is, how do the marginal bid rents? And as you do that, as you carry out that shift, you're changing the particular individuals who are marginal. Right? As w, YW goes up, you're getting a richer and richer marginal white and a poorer and poorer marginal black. Okay? And the question is, what's the bid rent of those two people? as you make this change, right? And that's plotted over here. And this point here is a point where both the marginal white and the marginal black household have a marginal bid rent of uh, uh, 0 0.02. That's this equilibrium here. So this guy's marginal bid rent is, is, is 0 0.02, and this guy's marginal bid rent is also 0 0.02. Okay? 
right? And when those two marginal big rents are equal to each other, you have an equilibrium. That's the equilibrium over here. Okay? Over here, the marginal big rent of the white household is 0.11. The marginal big rent of the white household is this. Okay? And the marginal big rent of the black household, which is this guy here, this is the marginal black household now, is something below that. So if the actual rent of the upper tail neighbor is 0.11, that makes the marginal white indifferent, and the marginal black refuses to pay that. So that's why all the blacks are in the lower, lower tail neighbor. So this is the equilibrium with segregation, and this is the equilibrium, which you never see. Which you never see, but it's an equilibrium nonetheless. Why don't you see it? Imagine a perturbation that is slightly to the left of this. Slightly to the left means that you're moving YZ, uh, YB YW to the left. So you move YW to the left, you move YW to the left, YB to the right, okay? You're making the upper tail neighborhood a little bit a little bit more white, right? You move YW to the left, you're putting more whites into the upper tail neighborhood. YB shifts up and you're putting less blacks into the upper tail neighborhood. So the upper tail neighborhood becomes a little bit whiter as you move, start with this equilibrium and move slightly to the left. Now you look at the marginal bid rents of the new marginal white and marginal black households. The marginal white household has a higher marginal bid rent, a higher willingness to pay in, to live in the upper tail neighborhood than the marginal black household. I'm almost done. What this means is that when you have shifted a few more whites into the, uh, into the upper tail and a few less blacks, and now you look at the marginal white and black households and say, how much are you guys willing to pay to live in the upper tail neighborhood? The marginal white will outbid, will outbid the marginal black. And so the neighborhood will become a little bit even more white, which will shift you even further to the left. And as long as this gap remains, the marginal white bit rent is bigger than the marginal black bit rent, you're going to be replacing blacks with whites in the upper tail neighborhood. What you're going to be doing is, you're going to be, as you shift this to the left, right? so more whites are going to the upper tail, and this to the right, the marginal bid rents are such that you're going to be moving in this way, and you're going to end up right here. Okay. So the reason the reason that's an equilibrium is because preferences are tolerant. The way that's the way it's been set up. Maybe there's still maybe preferences in the United States are not tolerant enough to sustain that kind of equilibrium yet. Mm -hmm. But what this says is even if there were, even if there were, there are forces at play in the absence of discrimination. Active discrimination and these relatively tolerant preferences of the neighbor racial population. Even if preferences were tolerant enough to sustain a, a, a great deal of integration as an equilibrium, there are forces at play through decentralized and coordinated choice that are pushing you towards, towards segregation. It's very hard to escape that. And the very last thing I want to say is okay, let's suppose that that's the case. Let's look at these two equilibria and compare them. Let's compare them. Here the marginal black household is richer than the marginal white household. Here the marginal black household is poorer than the marginal white household. Okay. Let's look at the implications. So now I've told you that the only stable equilibrium in this example, this is developed in much greater generality in the paper, but in this example, the only stable equilibrium involves uh, uh, this allocation. Okay. Now, look at people who are between 0.36 and 0.7. So look at people who have incomes between 0.36 and 0.7. Those people live in the upper tail neighborhood if and only if they are white. In other words, they live in the upper tail neighborhood if and only if they belong to the group that has a higher income. In other words, the advantage of having a high income let's say 0.6, is multiplied, is magnified, if you also happen to belong to a group that has high income. So if you have 0.6 income, so you're between this and this, and you're white, you're living in upper tail neighborhood. But if you have the same income, 0.6, and you belong to the lower income group, you're living in the lower tail neighborhood. What does that mean? That means that if you have income 0.6 and you're white, your average income of your neighbors is 0.68. It's richer than you. 
and you have a certain racial composition. But if you have the same 0.6 income and you're black, you're living in a neighborhood that's poorer than you, where the average person is poorer than you. And given the fact that this may have all kinds of effects on your ability to educate your children and so on and so forth, peer effects, holding constant your own individual characteristics through the process of neighborhood choice, you end up with disadvantages that accrue not from your being poor, but from your belonging to group that is on average poor. The last thing I want to do, I have maybe two minutes, yeah, two minutes, is to say, is this what we see, right? And I'll show you in a very dramatic way, this is what we see, okay? This is Manhattan, all right? Manhattan, I've already given you a picture of Manhattan. What does this say? The left-hand two columns are only for whites, non-Hispanic whites, okay? This tells you this tells you what my average neighborhood income is, given my own income. So for whites whose income is less than 10,000 a year, annual income is less than 10,000 in the 2,000 census, their average neighbors are earning 60,000. So they are in neighborhoods where their average neighborhood income is much greater than their own. As you get richer, so you can go up, these are the 16 income categories I mentioned to you. As you get richer, the largest is 200,000 or more, the largest category. As you get richer, your neighbors get richer. That's not causal, but you know, as you get richer, richer people are found in neighborhoods where the average income is richer. Not surprising, right? So the average income of your neighbors goes from 60,000 all the way up to 147,000. The people who are poor and white, their neighbors are gonna be richer than them. Not surprising. The people who are extremely affluent, their neighbors are gonna be poorer than them. Not surprising either. But richer people have richer neighbors, okay? But now compare, now you can do the same thing for black households. You get exactly the same thing. As you get richer, your neighbors get richer, right? But the levels are completely different. You have to have an income of about 125 to 150,000 to have neighbors that are approximately as rich as if you are the poorest among the white people. You have to be close to the top of the black distribution or close to the top of the American distribution to have neighbors who are as affluent on average than the people who are at the poorest in the white income distribution. This is the same thing shown in the diagram. And it shows that as you get richer, so this is the whites, as you get richer, these are 16 income categories, your neighbors get richer, and it's especially pronounced at the top. And for blacks, as you get richer, your neighbors get richer. But there's this enduring gap, and if you look at the poorest whites neighborhood income, and you go horizontally across, you've got to be extremely affluent <coughs> to match that, you know, to get, you know, to get neighbors of that kind, you know, you can't buy neighbors, you can buy houses. But you've got to be extremely affluent to end up on average with neighbors that the poorest whites have in this, in this particular data. This is just for Manhattan. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop now, but just leave you with this one thought. There's a lot of study in economics that uses uh, individual level data uh, to forecast performances. Uh, so they will look at your income, your education, and then try to say, okay, well, how well are your children doing in school? longitudinal data from you know, panel study of income dynamics or uh, you know, uh, national long longitudinal sur survey of youth, which has a lot of information about individual families. What's your birth order? What's your parents' income? What's your parents' education? Etc. Etc. But what it doesn't have <coughs> is properties of your neighbors. And there's a good reason why it doesn't have that. It violates certain privacy concerns. You know, you, you, you don't want to <coughs> allow people to identify people in this data. You can get somewhat geocoded data, but, but, but typically, you know a lot about the people and you know a lot about their families, but, and, but you know very little about their neighbors. And in this data, if you find, for example, that uh, 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 you know, children of black parents are performing at a certain level in school, even though their parents may be aff you know, quite affluent professionals and educated, what you may be picking up, at least in part, is the fact that they have very different kinds of neighbors. That's, that's my parting comment. So let's take, take a few, few ten minutes for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I love this presentation. We are going to see the sector inequalities and how that functions. But I want to go back to what I asked right in the beginning about autonomous jobs. Yeah. Because I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Yeah. You gave examples of really heterogeneity and beliefs and so on. Yeah. But, but since I tend to see the world primarily to the lens of gender, yeah. so you see how, um, you know, you often see the, you know, the fact that, oh, it's women choosing to specialize in reproductive care or choosing to stay at home. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. There's often this perception out there, but then that choice itself is associated with certain economic penalties and you see then how gender intersects with it. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's a very valid point. So there's two senses in which choice may or may not be autonomous. One is with regard to the choice of your group identity. Now, religion is a lot easier to choose than gender. So in that sense, gender is, is uh, uh, largely non autonomous A lot of people don't even consider, you know, transgender choices. So gender is in some sense very non autonomous in that sense. So it constrains choices in a very serious way. But you're also right that many of the decisions, so, so group inequality, yeah, yeah, group inequality, male-female earnings differentials, for example, um, you're right, it is commonly argued that uh, uh, women make certain lifestyle choices, make them, they have different preferences with regard to uh, child childbearing or child rearing and so on and so forth. And you could well argue that, that, that this is, uh, uh, this is uh, not really autonomous, that there's a lot of socialization at play and so on and so forth, and I, and I would agree with that. Um, you know, that's right. But, you know, my, my answer to that would be not to not to suggest that there is no possibility of autonomous choice with respect to gender, but rather that you want to expand the space of options to the point where you're bringing it closer to autonomous choice. So ex you know, expand the possibility of professional advancement, childcare leaves, uh, 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 you know, uh, childcare at work, so on and so forth. So that so that people's choices are a little less costly. So you know, to, to allow people to make certain kinds of choices in a way that's much less costly to them than it currently is. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that you know, you know, somebody who decides to interrupt their their, 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 their career and have children is incapable of autonomous choice. I, I, that would be going too far. I think. when you had a, um, so the first distribution, the first allocation that you put up, uh, where I think uh, there was like an equal distribution. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was not an equal equilibrium. Yeah. Which I said cannot be an equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just wanted to go back to the intuition for why that cannot be an equilibrium again. It, yeah, sure. Does that, is that yeah. the part that it has cannot, to be? It cannot be an equilibrium because, because for these two people, everything is the same, uh -huh. except for racial composition. Right. The incomes are the same. And then the mean income that they're comparing across these two neighborhoods is the same. Right. The so the only thing that can matter is how do you feel about a neighborhood that is 24% black versus a neighborhood that is 66% black. Now you go back to the preferences. How do you feel? The preferences look like this. So somewhere around here is a 24% own group. Right. And somewhere around here uh, is a 76% own group. Right. And when whites look at that neighborhood that is 24% black, they are seeing 76% own group. When blacks look at a neighborhood that is 24% black, they're seeing 24% only. It is only by the most remarkable coincidence that those two will lie on the same horizontal. Or, or if, right. The, one will be, I'm not saying which one will be higher than the other. But generically, they will not be equal. And if they're not equal, they'll have different marginal bid rates. And if they have marginal bid rates, you cannot have an equilibrium where the actual rate is equal to one of them and also equal to the other. So that's, that's the idea. One of the things that you could rule out then is the idea that people are sort of uh, truly indifferent about race. Because if they, if they were, they sort of got just the same. Yeah, another, that way that. To, another way to make your point is to say that we have assumed pro integration's preferences. Right. But if you have completely colorblind preferences, then pure sorting by income would be an equilibrium. And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But actually, people seem to care one way or another. Right. You know, what you're, what you're saying is that if race were not salient, then you would sort on some other, then you would not sort in a, in a way that makes race relevant. And that's true. But even when you have, whether your preferences are pro-integrationist or pro-segregationist, the salience of race is, is, 
is undeniable, at least in contemporary United States. Yeah. But, but the other thing I wanted to say is I, I take your point and Nalini's point that you, know, you can't necessarily go straight to uh, preferences for outcomes. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and this is an interesting idea that even if we had pro integrationist yeah. preferences, you would never, you could never less get segregation. But in fact, it's inevitable in this. Uh, yeah. But it still seems to me the more the more likely solution that you know white people in general would rather not live with black people. I mean, it, you know, that's not what they report to the respondents now. That's not. You, you, you have people, you know, there, there's a methodology that was developed in Michigan by sociologists, uh, uh, Farley and Frey and others, where you ask people to, uh, uh, you give them a blank neighborhood, actually, and they can just fill in, fill right. in attributes of the neighbors. Then there, there are those sort of subconscious, you know, discrimination sure. tests that give you different results. Sure, it could be it could be it could be insincere survey responses. Yeah. Uh, something in society has changed. Uh, sorry, there's just another question. Yes. Yeah. Um, no. Um, the point I was making was more conceptual. Maybe we have not reached a point at which equilibrium of the integration type can exist. But even if we were to reach that point, we wouldn't know it from what we see. Similar. Um, I was just kind of wondering, I, I really appreciate it, and certainly don't dispute the racial aspect of it, but um, as you generalize to the real world, like how do you account for goods that are associated with a particular neighborhood? Or you know, I'm thinking of when, when you were giving this you know, like Pascal's um, historical look at uh, Abe moving into the mission, and how, yeah. you know, so how does this um, sort of account for some of those other things? Well, segregation, I mean, uh, there's definitely segregation on sexual orientation, other kinds of groups, Asians and, you know, Italians, Poles, you know, ethnic enclaves in, in the United States, you know, as long as it's, you know, you had this island, you had these pockets. But if you just really look at measured segregation, there's something that jumps out, out at you about black, white, or black, non-black segregation in the United States that's just off the charts compared to anything that any other ethnic group has ever experienced. So there's that magnitude effect. And then with regard to with regard to gays, I mean definitely definitely there can be very positive aspects to, to segregation in, in terms of finding a community where you feel safe. That's in fact part of what drives you to avoid places where you're a small minority. I don't mean it quite like that. I mean okay. in the sense that um, if you don't need to send children to school or certain things that are associated with locations right. or neighborhoods that a lot of this maybe wouldn't hold, it, it, if that makes sense. I, I, I just think that whether, whether you're talking about black or white or Latino communities, you get this kind of heterogeneity within those communities with regard to who has children and who doesn't, who needs to be in a place with a good school and who doesn't. And if you if you had sorting on these dimensions, I don't think you could get the kind of map that I put up at the beginning, of my, the left-hand side map of Manhattan, which just, which just tells you, look, is there some correlate that could explain this level of sorting by race? Certainly, I try to make the argument that income can't do it. But if you look at you know, the, the average family size, you know, the, the age distribution, you look, you look at all the things that might cause people to live in one place rather than another, the differences across groups are even less than differences in income. So how do you then account for this extreme difference choices. I, I don't want to underplay or deny all kinds of other dimensions that are relevant for sorting, but I think that the, the racial dimension is first order. It's, it's undeniable. So, okay. I know that uh, I know there are probably a few more questions, but I'm also mindful that people have the will have group meetings and so on. Yeah. But what I'd suggest is, if the group leaders are okay, if there's any particular questions you want to ask. Uh, Individually, you can come and ask. Uh, ask. I'm, I'm, I'm three, four to six anyway. He's three, four to six, but just in case they have their group meetings, they can meet you for, uh, uh, sure. if there's some follow-up questions, uh, they can meet you very quickly and then go to their group. Meeting. Yeah, yeah, I'll be in whatever it is, two or four, whatever it is, S44, and, and just stop by even if you don't have an appointment. Okay, thanks very much.